Good morning, everybody. Okay, all right. It is so good to see all of you here today. Uh, I just want to take a minute at the very top. If you're a guest here with us today, thank you so, so much for spending a part of your Sunday morning with us. If you do us a huge favor and stop by the Welcome Center on your way out today, uh, we have a gift for you just to say thank you for being here. Um, right now, I, I, before we jump in the message, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware of a couple of things. Consider this a very personal invitation from me to you. This coming Wednesday night is our vision night as a church. It, it will be here at the church from 6 to 8 p.m. And if you consider yourself to be a part of LeClaire Christian Church, we would love, love, love for you to join us for that evening. It's going to be a great time together, but if you do plan on coming, please take a moment to go to our church app or our website and sign up for Vision Night. We are providing food for you, so we need to know you're going to be here so we can make sure we can feed you. Um, so if, if you do that for us, that, that wouldn't mean the world. And then also, uh, if you're somebody who can seriously clear your home, please uh, give, give, give your tithes and your offerings um, in the black boxes at the back of the auditorium. And as always, thank you so very much for supporting um, what all's going on here. But right now, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into the message. Jesus, thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together to be able to worship you, to be able to sing songs to you, to be able to uh, spend time with one another. And God, I just pray that here are these next several minutes that, that you will speak loudly and boldly. And God, that you will allow our ears and our hearts to be open, to be moved by you, that you will shine a bright light on all the dark areas of our lives, our, our apathy, our, um, the ways that we're self-absorbed or whatever it may be. Jesus, help us to become more like you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, this Bible right here means a lot to me. And the more years that go by, the more this Bible begins to, to, to mean. Um, this Bible was given to me on December 24th, 1988, by my grandma and grandpa Gibson. I, I, I was six years old whenever my grandparents gave me this Bible. And uh, so I did what six-year-olds do. Um, I, I tried to forge my grandma and grandpa's signatures under where they wrote their name. Because why not, you know? So, uh, but, but this Bible, it, it means a lot to me. My, my grandpa died several years ago. And then uh, it was last October that my grandma passed away. But the reason they gave me this Bible on December 24th, 1988, was because that was the day, that was the night, actually, that I was baptized um, at First Baptist Church in Carthage, Missouri, by Dr. S. Ray Cruz. And I don't know about you, but that's like the coolest preacher name I've ever heard in my entire life, Dr. S. Ray Cruz. That was my preacher growing up. You all are stuck with Andy Turner, whatever that means, you know. But I, I, um, I, I remember that night as much as a six-year-old can. I remember the, the white robe that I had to put on going down, and Dr. Cruz had his hanky and put it over my face and tried to smother me underwater and the whole deal. But um, I, I know at that time as a six-year-old that I didn't really know everything but my parents loved to tell the story of whenever I was around this age, one day I went to them in the kitchen and I said, Mom, Dad, I need to go forward at church on Sunday. And being a parent now with little kids, I can only imagine how excited they were to hear the rest of the sentence. Mom, Dad, I need to go forward at church on Sunday. Okay, Andy, why? Well, I need to go forward because I've been cussing and lying a little. That's what six-year-old Andy said. So... I think my parents really thought, this is my one chance. This is my, you know, this is our one. If we want to make sure our kid is saved, like, we better do it now or we're going to lose the opportunity forever. Andy Stanley says, as long as my kids love Jesus and know how to read a little bit, I feel like I did a pretty good job. And I think that's pretty much what my parents went with as well. And, and, and so I, I, I was baptized at six years old, didn't know a whole lot, but the thing that I did know was that I didn't want to go to hell. 
And honestly, I think that my decision to be baptized had a lot less to do with following Jesus and a lot more to do with just not having to go to hell. And perhaps some of you have made a similar decision. Maybe you said a prayer. Maybe you got baptized. Maybe, may, maybe you made a good decision. But whenever you made this good decision, it had a whole lot less to do with following Jesus than it did with just simply not wanting to go to hell. And I hope that you hear me right now. Like, not wanting to go to hell is a good thing. And it, it can be a pretty good motivator and a, and a reason to, 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 to make a decision or two. But, but... If our entire motivation for any public declaration of faith that we made, whatever it may have looked like in our, in, in, in our story, if it is simply to escape hell, then it can be really, really easy to miss the fact that Jesus came for so much more than to simply be our ticket into heaven. Jesus did not come solely so we could enter heaven when our time on earth was done. But Jesus came and conquered. And this is so huge. And man, I, I hope that this can just be maybe a constant theme in our minds as we go through this, this holiday, this Christmas season. Jesus came and conquered so we could participate in heaven while we were still on earth. Jesus came to earth, and when he came to earth, this is so huge. And when he came to earth, he brought a little bit of heaven with him. And whenever he ascended back into heaven, he left a little bit of heaven behind whenever he left his spirit to indwell in the believers so that way the believers of Jesus, those who have his spirit dwelling within us, could be little pockets of heaven wherever we find ourselves around the globe. Yes, obviously, Jesus came so that we would believe in him. But beyond that, he came so that that belief would lead us to action that that belief would lead us to participate in his kingdom. I just want us to let this sink in for a second this morning. Jesus, God in the flesh, you got that? The King of kings, the Lord of lords, has invited you, and you know you pretty well, has invited you, has invited me, has invited us to participate in his kingdom, on earth as it is, in heaven. So today we're in week two of our Christmas series called, called King. And, and all of Jesus' life from the very beginning to the very end pointed to his kingship. It, it showed that Jesus was, was God's final true king. It shows that Jesus was the Christ. It shows that Jesus was the Messiah. And, and all those terms are synonymous. They all mean the same, the same thing. And the declarations of Jesus' kingship, it would, they, 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 go, they go back before Jesus was, was even born in Bethlehem. And, 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 and many of us know about the Old Testament prophecies, 300 plus prophecies that, that, that Jesus filled, you know, fulfilled, 40 plus messianic prophecies that, that Jesus fulfilled. But, but even as we read the Christmas story in the Gospels, we see several dec de declarations about King Jesus. And one of those came from the angel as, as the angel was preparing Mary for the child she was about to give birth to. I just want you to listen to this. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 30. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Verse 32. This is where, where it really comes in. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. That's a kingly term. The Lord God will, will give him the throne. That's a kingly place. Of his father David. And, and he will reign. That's what kings do over Jacob's descendants forever. And his, his kingdom will never end. The story of Jesus' kingship is woven all throughout the original Christmas story. And, and the place that we've kind of decided to, to focus on with that being woven through is, is, is through the story of the Magi in the Christmas story, to where, where we have these, this, this, this kind of hard-to-define group of, of, of foreigners that show up in the middle of this story, and then you really don't hear anything else about them. We, we know them as magi. We, we, we know them as, as wise men. We sing songs about them being kings, even though they were not kings. 
We believe that they were intellectuals, that they you know, were, were very well versed in math and literature, astrology. They loved to study the stars in the sky. They believed that God would send, send, send messages through the stars, that God would speak through the stars. And so whenever you read what, what, what the Magi see and, and, and what the Magi are, are, are communicating in Matthew chapter 2, it makes sense whenever you understand how they view the star. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in, in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And so the, the Magi, they see this new star, a star that they had never seen before, and, and they believe that that must mean that the new king of the Jews had been born, that, that it was like God had written the birth announcement of his son in the sky. So they traveled hundreds of miles to get to the bottom of the story and to worship this new baby king. And to the Magi, this was big news, like a new star, a new prominent star, a new important star. That was big news, and so they expected, as we all do, whenever there's something that's big news to you, you expect it to be big news to everybody. But whenever they, they show up, they find out that it wasn't big news to everybody. They went to the place that they expected to be able to find the new king. If you are wanting to find one who's known as the king of the Jews, it makes sense to go to kind of the center of Jewish culture, which was Jerusalem, and it makes sense to probably go to the current one who is known as the king of the Jews, who was King Herod. Because if anyone would know where they could find this new king, surely it would be the current king of the Jews. But to their surprise, Herod did not know anything about this new king. And he wasn't real happy whenever he found out about the prospect of the new king. But Jerusalem, the rest of Jerusalem, they also weren't very happy about it either. Verse 3 says that when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him, because a new king meant a new regime, and a new regime meant new problems for the old regime. All kinds of civil problems could arise. If what these magis were saying was really true... Yes, it would mean problems for Herod, but it would mean uncertain times for the rest of Jerusalem as well. Again, we understand this. We can understand where the rest of Jerusalem was coming from because no matter how good or how bad things might be, uncertainty has a tendency to breed tension. Rocking the boat or challenging the status quo rarely takes place without some sort of consequence. Plus, whenever you look at who Herod was, the things that we know about Herod from history was that he was an incredibly, incredibly arrogant, arrogant man. He was a man who was completely consumed with his own legacy. His mind was made up that his family was going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem for generation after generation after generation. But the problem was for, for Herod that, that he did not come from the proper lineage to even be considered the king of the Jews. And so whenever he heard news about a new king of the Jews who did come from the proper lineage, it makes sense, again, that he felt threatened the way that he did. And so as we talked about last week, man, there, there is just so, so much and so much more than we're going to cover in this series. But there is so much that we can learn from Herod's role in this story. And one thing that we can learn from, from Herod is that Herod knew, he understood something that sometimes we miss, that any time a new king is introduced, everyone must make a choice. Where is your allegiance going to lie? And Herod, he understood that. And so as he's trying to process everything, it's so interesting to me as you continue to read Matthew's account here. He's processing this new threat of this new baby king, and in the process, he, he, he makes his own declaration about the kingship of Jesus. Verse 4, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them this question, where will the Messiah be born? Though he didn't know the answer, he had been in Jewish culture long enough to understand that, that, that generations of Jewish people had been waiting for, anticipating the arrival of the Messiah, of God's final true king, of the Christ. 
And so even in, in Herod's, you know, just, just trying to figure out what's going on, he makes his own declaration about who Jesus is. And the priests and the teachers of the law, they, they tell him that the Christ was to be born in the little, tiny, insignificant town of Bethlehem. And the Magi standing around us, they hear this. It wasn't long before they went on the road and they went six miles down the road to this town of Bethlehem. And it says in verse 9 that after they, they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them and it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down, these wise men, these adult, uh, respected people, they bowed down and they worshipped him. And then they opened their treasure and they presented him the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And once again, through their gifts, we get another declaration about the kingship of Jesus. Because their gifts, as most gifts do, most gifts rep represent like the giver of the gift. Here's something to remember me by. I look at this and I think of my grandma and my grandpa because they're the ones who gave it to me. But, but, but these gifts were not about the giver of the gift. These gifts were about the receiver of the gift, about the life he would live and about the purpose that he would fulfill. And as we talked about last week, the, the first gift of gold was, was the gift of royalty. It was the gift fit for a king. And throughout all of Israel's history, the gift of, of gold or, or gold and, and royalty were closely tied together. But then we get to this next gift, this next gift of, of frankincense. And here over the next several minutes, I, I want us to just look at, at what this gift represented. Because it points not only to who Jesus would be, but also to the life that he would live and to the role that he would fulfill. Frankincense spoke of Jesus' work as our ultimate high priest and the pleasing lifestyle that he would live to his Father in heaven. In the Old Testament, frankincense was, was a central piece of, of temple worship. It was used in temple worship and temple sacrifice. Whenever there is a priest that would be anointed for service, they, they, they would use frankincense and, and mix it with oil and use that for the anointing of the priest. And so in, in presenting this gift, the Magi pointed to Christ not only as our king, but as our great high priest, the one whose life would, what was acceptable and well-pleasing to his father. And as you read through the, the, the Old Testament and you kind of study a little bit about the high priest and what his responsibilities ultimately were, the high priest had many, many responsibilities and probably towards the top of the list of the high priest's responsibilities was to be a mediator between God and his people. But beyond simply being a mediator between God and his people, the high priest was also to be the enforcer of the covenant, meaning that there would be nobody who was more passionate or more zealous over the covenant that God had made with his people. The high priest was to be the blesser of the people. Again, this goes back to him being the mediator between God and his people. But another one of the high priest's biggest roles was the role of offering sacrifice, specifically on one day a year. There's a day known as the Day of Atonement. And it was on this one day a year that, that the high priest was able to go into the one room that he could only go into on this one day a year, a room called the Holy of Holies. This was like the hot spot of God's presence. And, and on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would offer sacrifices, not only for his own sins, but he would offer sacrifices for the sins of all Israel. That was the role of the high priest. But day in and day out, the high priest also oversaw everything that took place with temple worship. And so as we look at the high priest throughout history, we see that there is this combination of some good guys. We see that there were some bad guys. But underneath it all, you can see this longing for like the perfect guy, for the perfect high priest. And I love how the author of Hebrews kind of combines that, that longing for the perfect high priest with who Jesus is ultimately was in, in Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. He says, But he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. 
Now, there have been many of those priests in the order of Melchizedek, the, you know, one of the very first high priests who, who was viewed as like the, the, a great high priest. There were many of those priests since death had, had prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, this is so huge, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Verse 26 says that such a high priest truly meets our needs, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens, unlike the other high priests. He does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. So Jesus, the perfect high priest. Jesus, the covenant enforcer. Not the old one, but a a new one. A much simpler, yet much more demanding covenant. A loophole eliminating covenant. A covenant that changes the way that that, that we see ourselves. A covenant that changes the way that we see others. A a covenant that changes the way that we see suffering and pain. A, A covenant that changes the way that we see service and sacrifice. A covenant that changes the way that we even see our enemies. A covenant that can be summed up with with what's the greatest command? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. This is the first and greatest command. The second is equally as important to love your neighbor as yourself. A covenant that can be summed up by saying love the Lord your God with everything that you have and then prove it in the way that you love others. A covenant that Jesus continued to drive home even on that night that he was betrayed as he took off his outer robe and he got down on his hands and knees and he took the lowest of low servant-like positions and he began to wash his disciples' feet. And then he looked at them and said, I have set an example for you, for you to go and do likewise. That very night, Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you belong to me, that you are my follower, if you love one another. Another, he came with a new covenant, but Jesus, the high priest, he also was the blesser of people. He was our mediator, our hope, our salvation, and yes, he is our king. Jesus, the ultimate high priest, he is the atonement for our sins. You remember whenever Jesus was crucified and the veil tore between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple. No longer was there anything that was there to separate the people from the hot spot of God's presence. Because Jesus took that on himself. The Apostle Paul says that Jesus, he died once, and and that he died to sin once and for all. John, the Apostle John, he put it like this. And man, I just love picturing John as he's writing these, these letters as an old, old, old man. I mean, he has lived a lot of life, and he's experienced a lot of things, and he has, you know, for decades been doing everything he can to remain faithful and true to his best friend, To the one that he saw, the one that he lived with, the one that he saw die, and the one that he saw alive again. And this is what he said. He said, my dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is our great high priest, our king who has become the object and the center of our worship, the center of our lives. Meaning that everything that we do and everything that we are must exist to make much of Jesus. It's why the Apostle Paul would say, and this is probably a pretty familiar verse for many of you, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, you know this one? A view of God's mercy to offer your bodies, your lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. For this is your true and proper worship. See, church, this, 
This whole following Jesus thing that so, so many of us claim to belong to, it was never meant to be something that we just simply believe in. But it is something that we are meant to participate in. Because whenever you take a step back and you look at the Christmas story and what the Christmas story really is, the Christmas story at its core is the birth of a king. It's the story of the birth of one who has authority over your life and mine. Jesus came to be, to, to, to be more than the religious figurehead that sometimes we reduce him to. He came as the true king to rule and reign in our hearts and in our lives. He came to introduce a kingdom that moves us beyond, true, uh, to, beyond belief to true participation, true followership, and true submission to our king. Whenever you take a look back at history and you see the times in history whenever Christians have, have literally changed the world, do you know how that's happened or why that's happened? Christians have changed the world when groups of Jesus followers come together and they not only believe the right thing, but they follow the actions of their king. They participate in his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And so here's the question that I I feel like that we just have to continue to wrestle with throughout the course of this series. For those of you who claim to belong to Jesus Christ, for those of you who would say, Jesus is my king, here's the question. Does your life prove that Jesus is really your king? Does my life prove that Jesus is really my king? Do we as a church, do we prove that Jesus is truly our king? If the answer is yes, then we must participate in his kingdom. And we must prove it daily because it's always been the the provers and the participators in this kingdom who have made the greatest impact on this world it's always been those who forgive the unforgivable it's always been those who follow the ways of Jesus it's always been the participators in the kingdom it's always been the humble and the meek the bold and the compassionate the empathetic It's always been those who are able to consider others better than themselves. It's always been those who are willing to go to those who are far away. Those who understand that just because maybe we're in this place doesn't mean that we have an upper hand on anybody, but that the ground is level at the foot of the cross for all to come to Jesus. The world has always been changed by by, by believers in Jesus who, who love one another just as Jesus has loved us. The world has been changed by those who follow the example of their great high priest. The world has been changed by those who are willing to participate in the kingdom of their king. So is that you? today. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for the hope that we have in you. And God, I do pray that you will open our ears and our eyes, our minds, our hearts to who you are and what you're doing within us. God, I know I am, it's so, so easy to, to become apathetic, to, to elevate my will and my kingdom above your will and your kingdom. But God, I pray whenever I do that, I pray whenever we do that, Holy Spirit, that you will convict us deeply. So Father, we thank you that you gave us the example of Jesus. We thank you for his atoning sacrifice. 
we thank you for the hope that we have. And Father, we give our allegiance to your kingdom. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Right now, we're going to move into our time of invitation and communion.